This lump of copper ore could, up until the end of the last century, have been mined at Hecton Hill. For, by an accident of geology, this limestone hill on the borders of Derbyshire and Staffordshire contains some of the richest deposits of copper ore ever found in the British Isles. Alongside the magnificent Castle Folly with its distinctive copper tower is the educational centre run by Jeff Cox. The many artefacts collected from the mines help to bring to life the story of the mine's 400 year long history. The River Manifold runs close to the start of our tour, Ecton Deep Adit. On the way we learn something of the catalogue of achievements at Ecton. Many remain unique. The use of explosives was pioneered here and the balance beam hydraulic pumping engine we're to hear more about was one of the largest ever built. There's many aspects of mining at Ecton, but we're concerning ourselves mainly with the manner in which the mine was kept dry and which enabled ore to be mined to depths of over 1,000 feet, a record depth at the time. The portal of the so-called Deep Ecton adit, which was the second adit, that was used to dewater the upper 300 feet of the workings. First out, it used to run out to Apes Tor on the north side of the hill. That was put in in the mid 1700s, and they didn't have enough room to dress the ore at the portal of the added there. It was too close to the river. So once they found they got a major ore body to work on, they stopped using that added. Basically, drove the second one here, and it, the original date was 1774 on the portal here. We had to rebuild this in 12 years ago or so, due to a collapse. But basically, once they'd driven this added in, they didn't need the first one anymore. And they actually used the first one to bring the water into the mine to operate a hydraulic beam engine to dewater the lower workings. And we'll go and have a look at where it was. There's none of the engine left anymore, but you can see the site pretty well. <laughs> the adit, or drainage level, is over a thousand feet long and for the first 200 feet is beautifully lined with dry stone arching. Lining such as this would have been very expensive and illustrates the importance and optimism prevailing at the time it was built. Further in, the rock can support itself and lining is dispensed with. Before reaching the heart of the mine, the engine chamber, Jeff pauses at the foot of a large diameter shaft to explain the use of another first for Ecton, the Bolton and Watt hauling engine. What we're looking at here is the main deep engine shaft, which was operated by a steam engine, one of the first five Bolton and Watt engines ever installed. The engine was installed here at the surface in 1788, and from then on the mine became very profitable for about the next 50 years. The engine situated at service, one of the first five Holden Watt engines ever built, and the only surviving one now, sadly this one was scrapped at the, when the mine closed at the end of our century, the only surviving engine to that model is in the science museum in South Kent. This engine operated with hemp ropes and was total depth of about 1,350 feet from shaft collar to the sun. And the shaft goes down about 1,050 feet below. And the low, we're located only a couple of hundred yards from the river. Basically, this is a very dry mine. So we're talking there uh, 1,000 foot deep. 1,000 foot mud hole. This simple sketch map of surface and underground features shows our route in along the adit. We've paused to look at the hauling engine shaft and now we're about to enter the important pumping engine chamber. Afterwards, we'll leave via the ancient ladderway and ascend to salts level and back to the centre. Well, I thought you'd put your... Uh So this is the site of the Ecton engine. 
action pumping engine. Which is basically initially just a seesaw. There's a somewhat similar model in the Putnam's Mining Museum in Matlock Bar. But basically, Garth is standing now just by this Gritston Dam, which was used to block up the inner end of the eight store attic. Looking straight ahead, you're looking down the eight store attic, running to the north, which goes about 600 feet and originally went out to daylight by the bank of the river on the north side of the hill. And of course, the outer 30 yards or so is destroyed when the road was built at the turn of the century. But when they had the second edit that we've entered by in 1774 onwards, they didn't need this first edit. So as I say, they packed the spring about three quarters of a mile upstream. They brought the water in a leap alongside the valley, then brought it across the river in a wooden launder, and the outer end of the edit basically had a vertical wooden pipe with about 22 foot head. They had 22 foot head of water. So it could then flow 600 feet horizontally at one in 200. So the inner, inner end was three feet higher than the outer end. So it still had about 18 feet of head effectively by the time it got to the inside where Garth's standing now. They built a gritstone dam there, which was hand carved pieces of gritstone fitted together with tongue and groove formation on it basically. So they made a watertight seal on the inner end of the attic. And if you see Garth's light shining up, above your head now, yeah. to see where it comes out in the back above our head. So they used up the 18 foot ahead, effectively had water pouring out through the back up there where our lights are shining, all their gas lights shining up through there, had that rays going up about 45 degrees. Then all they had to do was to build the water engine, which was simply a 65 foot long wooden beam, fulcrums above Paul's head and above my head here. Um, the end near Garth had a thousand gallon capacity bucket on it, wooden bucket. So the water would fill that bucket and was, when the bucket was full there was sufficient weight to tip the beam slowly and the bucket would come down and hit the deck and the other end of the beam was over the pumping shaft, attached to the pump rods that went 850 feet down the shaft. Basically once the bucket had hit the deck here, it tipped itself automatically, emptied itself and the weight of the pump rods was sufficient to operate the pumps one stroke all the way down the shaft. Did two and a half strokes a minute, had a thousand gallon capacity in the bucket each time, so it was using two and a half thousand gallons a, min a minute, falling this distance here about 18 feet, to pump the water from 850 foot down. It was only pumping 40 gallons a minute. If you work out the efficiency, it's roughly 32%. You know, you wouldn't expect any more because obviously On the way to the ladders, a few remaining scraps of copper and some carefully picked graffiti add human interest to our visit. Miners don't usually leave much behind at all. The climb out to Salt's level is roughly the height of a ten-storey building. Best to take it steady. The original ladders, about half of them are, are original. Strictly speaking, they're the so-called new mine ladders that were put in in 1860 on. So they're only 120 or 130 odd years old. Basically, we've got 120 feet of bridge now. The disadvantage is you don't get copper in solution of the H7, whereas in mines like the Paris Mountain Mines in Anglesey, there's local men still making a living extracting copper from the water that runs out of the attic. We can't do that here, unfortunately. <laughs> the we don't get the copper in solution. Otherwise, I'd be driving around in a copper-plated Cadillac. <laughs>